Hey, welcome to Press Pass TV. Thanks for joining us. I'm Michael Artsis. We have a special treat for this uh, segment. We've got Hallie Efron on the phone. She's uh, calling in from Boston, from the Boston, Massachusetts area. And uh, we're going to be talking about her new book, Never Tell a Lie. It's a really great book, um, a mystery, thriller, suspense novel, if you will. Uh, I don't want to give up too much of the book. I, I mean, I thought the book was really, really excellent, but I'm always careful not to give up too much of the book. Uh, it really was, was just such a great book. Um, and, and wow, it just it really blew me away. But I want you to just jump into tell us a little bit about the book. Well, I'll, I can tell you where I got the idea from, and it'll give you an idea. It'll give people an idea kind of about the book. I got the idea for this story when I was, and it doesn't sound very exciting, but at a yard sale. I love yard sales. I go to them every Saturday when the thaw, when, when, after the thaw in the spring. And this was one that was around the corner from my house. It was a big Victorian where my daughter used to play, but there were major problems with this house. Little rooms, rabbit warreny, dark. And I was chatting with the woman in the driveway, the new owner, asking how they'd renovated it. And I am peppering her with questions. And finally, I think just to shut me up, she said, would you like to go inside and look around? And she pointed to the door and said, help yourself. It's empty. I did a little double take. Cause how many people invite a complete stranger into their house? But I must have looked harmless. I went in, and I'm wandering through the first floor. It is gorgeous. Knock down dead gorgeous up to the second floor. I'm finally on my way to the third floor when the writer in me kicks in, and I think, what if a woman talks her way into a house at a yard sale? And I wasn't sure how. She goes inside, and she never comes out. And that was the premise for the book. I got out of that house so fast. <laughs> it was like I made, you know, skid marks in the driveway because I scared myself. Um, and I wasn't sure uh, who who would my protagonist be, but by the time I got home, I decided that uh, my character, my hero, my point of view character, would be uh, the woman having the yard sale, and her name would be Ivy, which is the name I always wanted to give my first child, and my husband didn't like that name, so <laughs> got to give it to this character. That's, that's, and the, and a, that she would be nine months pregnant. And the woman coming to the yard sale would be someone that she knows but hasn't seen in a long time who's also nine months pregnant. So that's the setup for the book. I think that, uh, I mean, what's really cool is you did all your research by going to a yard sale by accident. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of your research was done instantly. It's, it's, it's really true, although I did have to, um, one of the things I wasn't sure was if someone disappears uh, in suburban Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is where I live, in fact, in my town, how would my police respond? Would they call in the state police as they would in a homicide investigation? Or do they have detectives on the force? So actually, I went down to my local police force also to research, and I met with two detectives there. And, oh, they showed me where they book people and where they hold people and went through the whole process of, um, you know, how you would be driven in and let in. And all of those details found their way right into the book. What was that like for you? I mean, that must have been a great experience. I mean, to me, that's so fascinating. And it's I... absolutely fascinating, I know. And, and as a mystery writer, you know, well, part of it is, you know, we all watch CSI, we all watch, you know, all these television programs, and we think the world is like that. It's not. And actually readers think the world <laughs> is like that, yeah. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to base it on uh, my television experience. I did want to base it on the real world. And the truth is that, uh, local local police departments are actually quite different in different parts of the country. They operate differently. So I all I wanted was one correct version, and um, then, you know, I could go from there. But, you know, there are details that you wouldn't even think of. Like, um, it, you know, there were no bars on the holding cells. There were plexiglass sliding doors, and the toilets in the holding cells were made out of stainless steel because they had inmates break them. I mean, all these little details that and there were handcuffs hanging from the counter where they would book someone, so they would make them take off their shoes, and they had a place for shoes, and then handcuff the person to the counter and then videotape them while they were, you know, I don't know, you know, booking them. All those details are just fascinating, and, yeah. and of course, you put them right in a book, and they make for wonderful um, realistic feeling context in a book. Wow, that's so true. And and it what you say about the police forces all over the country doing different things, it always amazes me. I was a 
uh, news, a general assignment news reporter for, for many years. And when I, different towns I worked in, finding out that different towns had different policies and different ways of doing things, it seems to me like it really across the board, especially in the times that we're living in now, everything should be kind of standardized. And it seems like, it almost seems like it's like the Wild West out there. Like this, I know, this police I know. department really does true. what it wants and this one does what it wants here. And it, it's so mind boggling. Yeah. Uh, there's a state, uh, one of the New England states, I think New Hampshire, actually the medical examiner, it might not be New Hampshire, but at any rate, one of them has a medical examiner who's an elected official. You don't need to be a doctor. You could be anybody. It's, it is really bizarre yeah. the, uh, the way things have evolved. Now, what about uh, the pregnancy issue? Um, what, what made you make both of these women pregnant? Well, you know, one of the things that the books tell you to do, you know, and I wrote one of the books on mystery writing myself, is you want to put your character in jeopardy in a, a moment uh, where a person has a great deal at stake, a lot to lose. And I thought, well, what's the moment in my life when I had the most to lose? And it was at the moment when I was about to have my first child. I mean, I felt more vulnerable than I had ever felt in my life. I was alone. I had stopped working. All my friends were at work. My husband was at work. I was in a neighborhood. I barely know my neighbors, as most of us do. You know, we really are centered in work. And, um, and I had this child about to be born that I hoped would be born healthy, that I hoped would be uh, an easy baby, but you just never, you just didn't, it was like stepping off a precipice. Had no idea whether you were going to, you know, land safely or, uh, or, or crash. Something very scary, I, I imagine. It's not something I've gone through myself yet, but how did you get through that? Well, I mean, it was a tough time. Um, fortunately, I, you know, went into labor and had a beautiful baby. Uh, my children are now in there. I you know, have two beautiful grown daughters who, who were just great babies. But, but, um, but you know, there's, there, even after the baby's born, you feel like this person is completely dependent on you. You've never had somebody completely dependent on you before. I mean, you just get on with your life. You try not to think about it. That's what you do is you ignore it all. I mean, there's no other thing to do. You've, uh, I, I mean, I guess that's the only way to, to do it uh, realistically. You just, you just got to plug along and, and, and go and not, not necessarily think so much about it, not spend time thinking about it. Just like, I guess, everything else in life, you, you sometimes just have to react. Um, you, now, you've written other books, um, including um, writing and selling your mystery novel. Um, you, but you broke some of the rules in this book that you, you wrote about. Yeah, do you think I did? Um, well, I, I haven't read Writing and Selling Your Mystery Novel, but uh, in the notes it says you did, and you, you admit you did. Um, yeah. And I, well, actually, what I, what I broke were my rules for how to write. I, don't, I mean, it's not really rules for how to write. There's a million ways to write, and, right. and the truth is if you end up with a good book, then you wrote it the right way, but for you. But one of the things I always recommend to, um, to new writers is to, is to have some idea where you're going to kind of try to outline as much as you can or write a synopsis before you set out. And with this book, I'm telling you, I went to that yard sale, I went home, and I started writing. I didn't really think through... I let, I let the characters kind of uh, carry me along, and as a result, I, lent, I ended up in a huge number of ruts, places where I just couldn't figure out what was going to happen next. And, uh, for instance, there's a point in the book where my character ivy gets locked in an attic and i'm telling you for six weeks i was locked in that attic with her i couldn't figure out how to get her out i mean i had an idea how i was going to do it but when i went to write it it just seemed preposterous i mean she's nine months pregnant you know she's not gonna be you know blowing out walls or jumping around so it it really took me a long time and it wasn't until i was um driving to connecticut that i was Six weeks later, thinking about, of all things, children's games, and I'm thinking about Monopoly and Candyland and Shoots and Ladders, and I'm thinking, Shoots and Ladders. And one of those is the way Ivy gets out. Now, you know if it's a shoot or a ladder, but I'm not going to tell your listeners. Right, and I, I <laughs> They're going to have to read the book. I don't want you to give it away. I, no. I, I also think, and I don't I don't want to give this away either, but the, the book starts very different from most mystery books, and... What made you start it that way, and, and how did you 
how did you make that work? I, I thought it was interesting, for especially for a book. I, I don't yeah. think I've read another book that started the way this book did. Yeah, well, um, it actually starts with a news article, uh, which tells you, tells the reader that the character that they're about to re- meet in the first chapter, which is a yard sale, is going to disappear. And I deliberately put that article first because I wanted the reader to know that this just wasn't going to be an everyday yard sale, that something was going to happen. One of the characters was going to have a disappearance. She was going to go away. And that kind of casts a feeling of suspense over what's a very ordinary scene. Ivy and David are throwing a yard sale. This woman shows up. She's very nice. Ivy kind of recognizes her. She kind of doesn't. But she feels odd. You know, that character, that Melinda White, comes and she just feels like she's slightly off-key, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she makes Ivy very uncomfortable. And it made the scene more, I guess you could say, charged electrically if the reader knows she's going to disappear. This is when, when, when that screen door slaps shut behind her and she goes into the house, that's it. It was almost, in my mind, like starting a book like a Quentin Tarantino film. And, oh, but really? I, but I really liked it, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, like uh, I, I, what pops to mind is Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs. Um, oh, good. Both of those uh, kind of pop to mind. And, and it's not the exact same thing, but it's the same kind of idea. And I, like I said, I've never really read a book that started this way, and I really enjoyed that, and I thought it was interesting. And like you said, it, it certainly created an electricity and, and, and suspense. Now... One thing also that was interesting, I think, is that, um, you know, the relationship with Ivy and her husband and and what, um, you know, she winds up finding out when she's digging for stuff. And I find that so interesting because the people that we care about in our lives, we know so much about them, but yet we don't know all that much about them, especially when we're not around. They're, they're not with us for most of the day or most of our lives. Um, and it makes me think of the Billy Joel song, uh, the uh, the stranger, because we all have a face that we hide away forever, um, yeah. and we take it out and show ourselves when everyone is gone. Some are leather, some are satin, whatever. However it goes, but that's what uh, I th- I think of immediately, and it really is interesting that we don't know what happened before. You know, especially for a spouse, we don't know. We don't really know what happened before we met them. We only know what we're told. That's right, and, and especially things that happen in high school, because this book, of course, revolves around something that happens in high school that David hasn't really talked about. He's tried not to think about. And I, I, but I also think that these kinds of, you know, traumas in our past that involve other people are very different when we look at it from the other person's perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's like a car accident. You know, four witnesses, you can have four stories of, about what happened. Mm-hmm. It's all and, your particular uh, vantage point. It's, it's yeah. Your perception is your reality, and somebody else's perception is their reality. Yeah, and so that was part of what I wanted to get at with this, was the different uh, perceptions of, of this sort of pivotal event in David's past that he's tried to forget about, hasn't talked about, and then it gets dug up. We're talking with Hallie Efron, the author of Never Tell a Lie. It's a wonderful mystery novel. I uh, highly recommend uh, checking it out. It's on uh, bookstands now. Um, You had a really interesting uh, upbringing. Your parents were both screenwriters. You you moved from uh, the New York area to uh, Hollywood, and then um, you got a chance, and and I think that this is the most interesting thing, you got a chance to see Marilyn Monroe, um, rehearse a scene for your parents. What was that like? Well, I mean, I think I was pretty young. I think I was maybe five or six or seven years old, but I remember very vividly. It was a scene, I think the movie was No Business Like Show Business, uh, which had Dan Daly and um, and um, Ethel Merman, and Marilyn Monroe was in it, and so was Mitzi Gaynor, I think. And uh, the, the, the scene was they're having a heat wave, a tropical heat wave, the temperature's rising, it's really surprising. And she was dancing uh, and singing, and I watched it. And, uh, you know, all the colored lights that they were using, it was amazing. And so I watched them film it, and then afterwards I was there with my my dad, and uh, 
she came out and she was wearing this part I even remember very vividly. She was wearing, we used to call them pedal pushers, very tight pants that came down just below your knee. Yeah. And a kind of a crop top and a babushka, a, 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 a not very flattering headscarf, <laughs> sunglasses inside, and it's, you know, the sets are dark. It's, you know, you're like in a big cave, and her sunglasses. And she looked frowsy. I mean, she really did. Oh, and I remember the, um, you know, the, the slip-on high heels, you know, without backs. Huh. And uh, that was her. She was very nice. She seemed very tired. Um, I think she was exhausted. I think she was ready to go home and go to sleep. But it was interesting, that contrast between, um, you know, the, the on-screen Marilyn and, yeah. and 15 minutes later, you know. On well, her way home. Well, I always think it's interesting. Um, I, I mean, it seems like she 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 could she just knew how to turn it on, like a light switch. But I always think with stars that we really only know what they want us to know, and they really could be completely different than what we think their image is. They could be homebodies and never want to leave the house, but yet we think they're party animals because we only see them out or have you know pictures of them out. Or they could be one type of a person, and we think they're another. And they really it's it's such a like. It's such a false reality. It's it's really interesting. But Marilyn Monroe is is a, obviously a legend, and it it's I always think it's got to, it's so interesting when you meet a legend and you don't realize it when you're going through it because they're just another person and and you are introduced and you know you just go through the normal uh, situation like you would go with anybody else. But yet um, when you reflect on it, it's you go wow that was really amazing. I met this person and. Uh, I mean, do you, do you ever, you know, th- sit and think about that situation and, and go, wow, that was pretty cool? Well, I mean, people are always wowed when I tell them that I've met her. <laughs> They're more uh, wowed than you for are. for sure. <laughs> I, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's it, you don't know who's going to become, uh, you know, the, the great dead movie star, which, of course, <laughs> she is, you know. If I had met Jimi Hendrix, I probably wouldn't have known that he would be. Wow, you met Jimi Hendrix, and you know these people are tragic, which is in part what makes them. You know, the, the flame burst. She, you know, she burst into flame and then was gone. Yeah, well, and that actually I think makes them more popular a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I often wonder what a you know an eighty five year old Elvis would be today. Um, <laughs> you know, he, so he lasted a pretty long time considering he, he, how much he abused himself that is true that is true yeah. now what do you do to relax what do you do for fun what do you do to kick back well yard sales obviously uh, <laughs> I write about them in the book I really do enjoy them on Saturday mornings it's a kind of ritual my husband and I plot our our, our uh, route like uh, Sherman do you go to open <laughs> houses a lot too do you go into people's homes and I'm just no, curious about no, this no, no, no. <laughs> no, I just I just like old stuff, old junk, but not too much. And are we talking antiques? Or are we talking like knickknacks and uh, stuff? You like You know, that? it's just stuff that appeals to me. I, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a capital C collector. My husband is. He collects old books, but but mostly I just I, I just like things that I like. Uh, you know, like uh, I have a lot of clip-on earrings, and uh, I'm not a I'm not a serious girl collector, but I like buying old stuff, and. Um, and I also love to read, of course, and uh, travel, and I'm a great cook. Really? I am. I'm what, a real, if I do say so myself. What do you like to cook? I'll cook anything, but, uh, you know, like great roast chicken or um, pot roast or uh, comfort foods. I'm, uh, Very nice. Yeah. And what do you like to read, and what authors do you like to read? Well, you know, I review crime fiction for the Boston Globe, so pretty much right now I'm my my uh, dance card as far, as far as books has been pretty filled up for the last three or four years, sadly, with mysteries. But there are some there's some great stuff. I mean, I just read um, a wonderful book called Beat the Reaper. Okay. And um, just read Val McDermott's new book, which I am enjoying very much, called Darker no- Domain. So I read a lot of, of crime fiction and um, thrillers, mysteries. Does that does that ever help you? With uh, or did that help you here with Never Tell a Lie? I, I think what it helps me with is I can spot a cliche at a mile off, you know, because I read so much. I know what people are writing. I know a cliche when I see it. And I think that's good because um, I can steer clear of them. The bad part is um, I can't turn off the inner critic. So it's hard writing first draft. I mean, you should be able to just write to write, you know, a lousy first draft and then revise it. 
but when you've got that inner critic nagging in your brain, it really slows you down. So that that's a, that's the downside. Yeah, I, c- I could imagine uh, certainly being very critical and hard on yourself. Did you did you write a review of this book just not actually for the paper, but just so you could see how you did, like a like, almost like a report card of yourself? Oh gosh, no, heavens, I kind of think no. that would be a fun exercise, though. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe I not. mean, all you want to hear about your own book is good news, i got to tell you. But it always, I mean, it could help you with the next book because you could say, I could do this well, better. This uh, See, this is what I know, do. I, this is what I do when I when I edit a video. I look back at it. I, w- I wait like three weeks, and then I look back at it and go, oh, what could I have done differently? Oh, I could have done this. I could have added that. Now, the audience never knows. They might yeah. think it's the greatest thing. They don't know what I, don't, what I didn't include or what I don't have in there. Um, but I always look back, and then I hate myself. Yeah, well, I try not to do that. I'm in a writing group, so I have people who read my work as it's evolving and give me really strenuous and honest and deep criticism. So I feel like I'm getting it along. I'm doing that as I go along. But once it's done and out there, it's like, you know, I want criticism on what I can change. And you can't change the book at this point, so no, no it's, criticism. It's but it was really it was an excellent book. So I'm not. I'm just. Well, thank I'm just you curious. so much. It's, it's in a third printing already. It's doing very nicely. Wow. So I'm, I have uh, high hopes. That's pretty amazing. Now, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? And what, what's what's it like being a writer and also at the same time, while still being a, a writer, uh, but being a, a reviewer? Well, I. You know, I grew up in this family of writers. My parents were screenwriters. My sister Nora's, you know, infamous, famous, incredibly talented. My sister Celia and Amy are both published novelists and screenwriters. They're kinda, very talented. Kind of your destiny, huh? Yeah, and so I had it in the genes, that's for sure. But I was the one who always said, I don't write. Uh, they write, I don't write. Um, but I got to be about... Um, about the time my my uh, my younger daughter was in uh, at, uh, starting to get towards the end of high school, and a woman called me, a magazine writer, and she asked if I would uh, if she'd mind uh, if I'd mind if she could write a piece about me, a, a magazine piece. I said, "Why about me?" She said, "Well, you're the only one who doesn't write." <laughs> Ouch. Ouch, that's what I said. And I said to her, I heard myself say, you know, if anyone's going to write about me not writing, it's going to be me. And that's about the time I started uh, seriously starting to write. I started writing essays, went on to fiction, and, um, and uh, you know, my first book came out in the year 2000. It was a mystery novel. And now this book is number eight, so I've been kind of chugging away regularly. What's, uh, what's next for you? Um, I have a, uh, another novel that I have under contract that I'm working on that will probably be uh, at least two years off wow. in terms of in the bookstores, yeah. And um, and I have a nonfiction book uh, that I just turned in called The Bibliophiles Devotional. It's just a fun book about, you know, a book a day, 365 days, 365 books. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. What uh, Can you give us a little, uh, a little tease on the uh, other book you're working on? Well, it's kind of the inverse of this book. This book, uh, Never Tell a Lie, is really about a woman who lives in the outer world. She has a job. She has a life. And slowly her world implodes until she's isolated and alone. And in this new book, it's the reverse process, really. I start out with a woman who, for various reasons, is housebound. Um, she's afraid to go out, and something happens, and she has to go out and find out what happened. So it's kind of it's kind of the uh, the opposite plot. Well, uh, based on this and how good I thought this book, Never Tell a Lie, is, uh, I certainly recommend uh, and look forward to that book when it comes out. About two years, and you've yep. got uh, a lot of other books people should check out. Hallie Efron, thank you so much. Never Tell a Lie is the new book. It's on book stands right now. Check it out. Uh, publisher, William Morrow. And uh, Hallie, thank you so much for joining us. You were great. And, again, I love the book. So go uh, check that book out. You'll definitely enjoy it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. I'm Michael Arts. For everyone at Press Pass TV, thanks for watching. Be terrific.